Well, today we are in part three of our message series, One Church, and we're at the halfway point of this series, and what we've been talking about so far is uh, what it means to be one church, and we saw in week one that, uh, well, what God wants is when one sinner repents, he throws a party, he celebrates, God values every single person, so we want to celebrate and value every single person as well. We want to be one church. Uh, Well, today to get started, I want to express something that I'm sure all of you have felt at one point in time or another, but you didn't know if you were allowed to say this in church. You say it after church, you've said it to your friends, you've said it to your family members, but you've probably never said it to a member of clergy, and you're definitely not allowed to say this in church. So as an officially ordained member of the clergy, I want to say something that you've probably felt before, but never felt allowed to say, and that's this. How many of you, like me, have ever left church, a church service, something like this, you're in a church service right now, in case you took a wrong turn, got caught up in traffic, you got in here, it's not a middle school for the moment. How many of you have ever left church and you would say, I don't know, it just didn't do it for me today? You left, you felt a little bit flat, you you, you didn't feel filled up as a result, you you didn't feel really connected or empowered by God. I hope I'm not the only person that's ever happened to. Has anybody ever had that experience? Okay, thank you for coming back, I appreciate that. Maybe maybe it's happened where you said, "I, I should read the Bible, I should open the Bible, I know it's important to read the Bible, so you open the Bible and you read it, or you try to read it, and you struggle through it, and you think to yourself, I don't know, it's not connecting, or I'm not connecting, or something's not connecting here, I don't know what's not connecting, but you close it and you say, I don't know, it didn't seem to help. I I still feel kind of flat. I don't feel fulfilled after reading that. I hope I'm not the only person in the room that's ever happened to. Okay, glad you're still hanging with me here. How many of you have ever, and this might be specific for those of you who love our church, um, how many of you have ever gone to one of our groups, one of our connection groups, and you leave from someone's living room and you're driving away and you think to yourself, well, that was nice, the people were really nice, but to be honest, I I don't really feel like I got filled up, still feel a little bit flat, and you don't really feel closer to God as a result of that. 90 minutes of my life. Has anyone ever felt that way before? I hope I'm not the only one in the room. Okay, thank you. I wanna talk about why that happens today because I think you've all experienced a church service where you leave and you feel very fulfilled, where you feel very satisfied. You're like, man, it was like Jesus showed up in the room today. It was amazing. You've probably had experiences like that before. Or maybe you've read the Bible and you're like, wow, this is so helpful. Uh, my, my faith in God just got so big. Or somebody quoted a Bible verse to you and it, you just, oh, this peace overcame you. So it's worked sometimes, or you've gone to a group sometimes and, and you just felt so empowered, so close to God to be with your Christian friends. So what I want to talk about today is how come it is that that sometimes you've experienced some of these spiritual exercises or spiritual disciplines and they just filled you up and other times it didn't really feel like it filled you up. Now, to be honest, there are nine or ten reasons why this can happen. For example, if the minister spends all day Saturday on the golf course, you might leave Sunday not feeling very filled up. That's something that's out of your control. Let me talk about something that is under your control and under your direct influence. And before I say what it is, I want to illustrate it in a way that I think everyone's going to get. There are some days where your phone is ringing off the hook. You have a lot of calls to make, a lot of texts to send, a lot of emails coming in, going out. Uh, You have a lot of apps open. And before you know it, close to the end of the day, you get that warning, 10%, 20% battery life left. And you don't go plug it in when that happens. What do you do? You start typing faster, I'm gonna beat the clock you know, before my battery runs out. You type faster, you email faster, you, know, you get your stuff done faster, and then you get home and you finally charge up your phone, you plug in your phone, and it just soaks up all the power and it takes a good long charge because your phone was so useful to you that day, your phone functioned so well for you that day, it now can soak up a huge amount of electricity because it is spent after working for you all day long. Or maybe there's another day where you don't really use your phone. You don't, you know, nobody's calling, you don't really have any calls to make, no texts going out, no emails, not checking your email, you're not opening any apps. You get to the end of the day, your phone still has a nearly full charge. You plug it in anyway because it's just your habit, it's what you do, but to be honest, it's not really soaking up much electricity, it's not soaking up much power because your phone has not been useful to you on that day. Your phone did not help you, it did not serve you in that day, and as a result, it does not have the room to receive a full charge. Did you know? That's a lot, 
like how spiritual life works. When you are pouring out your life for God's glory, for God's honor, in God's kingdom, when you are serving, when you are giving, when you are helping, when you are saying, how can I honor Jesus today with the people all around me, you are depleting yourself. And then when you plug in to the power source, which is God himself, all of a sudden you can get very fulfilled because you are very depleted. However, if you've got a week or a day where it's basically all about you, and you're honestly not being very useful in God's hands, you're not working in God's kingdom, it's just about you, you you haven't spent, you haven't depleted anything for God's glory, so when you try and plug into the power source, you're already full, you haven't depleted yet, you can't get charged up. Well, today we're going to be in a place in the Bible where Jesus talks about this very thing. Today we're going to be in what we call the book of Luke. Uh, Luke is one of the four authors of a biography of the life of Jesus. And as Luke is telling the story of Jesus, he comes to a place where Jesus explains this spiritual concept for us that explains why we can leave God's presence, whether it's church or Bible or whatever spiritual discipline or exercise you engage in, and still come away feeling somewhat flat. So we're going to be in Luke chapter 10 today, and we're going to begin at verse 1. It says, after this, now this is a good place to pause and preach. It's going to be one of those kind of sermons today. Just get comfortable. <clears throat> after this, well, what's the this? It's an important question to ask. Well, what had just taken place is Jesus had just taught something very specific. He was doing something very specific. Luke tells us that when people follow Jesus, there are basically three different groups of people following him around. Group one were the people who hated him. It was the haters. It was the critics. It was people who fundamentally disagreed with Jesus politically or religiously. Uh, they, they have categories. There's Pharisees. There's Sadducees. There's Herodians. There's teachers of the law. They did not listen to Jesus. They listened to all of his sermons, but they didn't listen to his sermons to grow, to learn about God. They, learned, they listened so that they could be critics, so that they could throw stones. A very dangerous place to be spiritually. So you you had the group that was the haters, but they were always crowding around. You had another group on the other extreme who were the followers. We're disciples. We're all in. We believe Jesus is from God. We're pretty sure he's the son of God, the Messiah, the Savior. We are following Jesus. We're on that team. So you've got these two groups. Well, in the middle, you have a group that Luke referred to as the crowd. Okay, they weren't haters, but they weren't followers. They're like, wow, this guy's sermons, they're different, and these miracles, they're amazing. We want to learn more. There's something big going on here. So they're just kind of the crowd. They're neither for nor against, kind of in this middle zone. Well, Jesus had just had a season of recruiting and calling people out of the crowd, out of that middle zone, to come and not only follow him, but to come and actually work in the kingdom of God, on mission for God, doing the things that please God. You see, Jesus, son of God, he embodied this. He was sent from God to earth to be a missionary. He was on a rescue mission to tell people about God's love and then to die for the sins of the world. And Jesus then sent out people to be missionaries, to tell people about God's love, to love and to serve our world. So he's calling people out of this crowd, out of this middle group. He'd say to one guy, hey you, come follow me. And someone else just volunteers, Jesus, I'll follow you. But to everyone, he said, before you follow me, let me make one thing crystal clear. It's going to cost you. It's going to cost you if you're going to step out of the crowd and be my disciple. Not cost you as in it costs you to get your sins forgiven. Jesus said, I'm already taking care of that. I am obligating myself to get you to heaven. That's my responsibility, Jesus says. But when you follow me, it's going to cost you something because you are no longer your operating system. I will become your operating system. You are no longer the center of your life. I will become the center of my life of your life because I am the God who made you and the God who loves you. It will cost you to follow me. So he goes through this recruiting season and once he has his people recruited to go and be on mission to follow him and send them out, here's what happens. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others 
and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. Now it says others because these aren't the 12 disciples. No one's ever named churches or cathedrals after these guys like they did the 12 disciples. These are people who are not named, but Jesus knew their name. These are people who are not named, but they made the Bible. That's pretty cool. If you made the Bible, that's like, you know, bucket list, check, made the Bible. They made the Bible for what? They made the Bible because they were willing to volunteer to go serve Jesus. They had other jobs. They were not getting compensated. This wasn't going to become a profession for them. They said, well, yeah, we'll volunteer. What do you need done, Jesus? We would love to give some of our time to the mission of God in our generation. So there were 72 of these others. We don't know their name, but they made the Bible. And Jesus sent them ahead to every town and place, this is so cool, where he was about to go. And I've got a question for you. If Jesus is about to go there, isn't this a little bit unnecessary? I mean, let me see. Who's going to preach the better sermon, Jesus, Son of God, or this unpaid volunteer? Hmm, I wonder who's going to have a better sermon today. I'm going to go with the Son of God category, right? If there's miracles to perform, if there's people to heal, who's going to do a better job, Jesus, Son of God, or unpaid volunteer? I'm going to guess again that's going to be Jesus who's going to do a better job healing people and doing miracles. So if Jesus is about to go there, if Jesus is about to show up in all of these locations, why does he first send out volunteers ahead of him to go to the places where he is about to go? And here's the answer. When the kingdom of God grows, okay, and by kingdom of God I mean when more and more people see the love and grace of God that Jesus Christ demonstrated on the cross to accept you, love you, forgive you, and call you his child. When someone who is a follower of Jesus engages in volunteering in kingdom of God ministry, the kingdom of God not only grows outside of you, the kingdom of God also grows inside of you at the same time. I can illustrate this very clearly from my own life. I remember a little over five years ago when I was asked to come, move here, be the pastor of this church, I saw what the church's vision was, what they wanted to do, and I thought to myself, wow, this is a church that could really use me. I was a little younger then, okay? And, and I learned very quickly, no, God needed to grow his kingdom, and not outside of me. God needed to grow his kingdom inside of me. And as we engage in the mission and ministry of Jesus Christ, God's kingdom not only grows outside of you as you are sharing the love and grace of Jesus through words and actions and deeds of service, but it also grows inside of you at the same time. Jesus could have done this work much better than the volunteers he was sending out to go do the work, but he wanted to involve them so that God's kingdom could grow not only through them, but also in them. And as he sends them out, these 72 unnamed volunteers, here's what he tells them. He told them, The harvest is plentiful. The harvest is plentiful. Now, I don't think Jesus is talking about agriculture as he's sending them out ahead to every place where he's about to go. What's he talking about? He's talking about people. Everywhere I look, Jesus says, everywhere I look, do you know what I see? I see people who are ready to have their sins forgiven by God. I see people who desperately need my grace, my love, and my presence in their lives. I see people that need to be rescued from an eternity in hell and given eternal life. Jesus looks around and everywhere he sees a harvest. The harvest is plentiful. Do you believe that's true? One person is with me, yes. (laughs) Do, Do you believe that when Jesus looks at our world today, he sees a plentiful harvest? Do you believe that when Jesus looks at our community in Lake Country, he sees a plentiful harvest? May I submit to you that the harvest Jesus envisions is probably bigger than the harvest you and I can envision and imagine because Jesus who gave his life for the world wants the world to know his love and his grace. How big of a harvest 
does Jesus have in mind for our community? How large of a harvest does Jesus have in mind for hope? How many people does Jesus intend to rescue through our ministry at hope? Can you envision it? How many? He sees a plentiful harvest. If that's what Jesus wants, I I mean, from that perspective, I've got to tell you, it's pretty easy to envision some scenarios where our church doubles and triples in the next few years because Jesus sees a plentiful harvest right here in our community, in our county, and in our state. Do you know why it's so easy not to see it? Because we lose focus. And that largely is the experience of American Christianity today. Right now in America, over 80% of all Christian churches are plateaued or in decline in attendance. Over 80%. Today, in our nation, millennials, those who are age 30 and under, it's estimated that only 15 to 20% of millennials are Christians today in America. Less than 20%. At the same time, 35% of Americans under the age of 30 have an anti-Christian stance. The church has been completely marginalized in America. And all the while, Jesus looks at it and sees a plentiful harvest to be had. Today in our world, as through the history of Christianity, Christians send missionaries to different countries. Ever since Jesus left the earth, the church has always sent pastors, ministers, missionaries to other countries to share the gospel, to preach about Jesus, to plant churches. Right now in our world, the nation of Brazil receives more foreign missionaries than any other nation on the planet. Guess what nation is number two on that list? The United States of America. Because when the Christian world looks at the United States of America, they do not see a Christian nation. They see a field that is ripe for harvest. Friends, can you see what they see? Can you see what Jesus sees? He sees a plentiful harvest. The problem is not on the demand end. There is a incredible demand for what Jesus provides. The problem is not even on the supply end. He has forgiveness for the sins of the whole world. Well, then what's the problem? We've got a huge demand. We've got an inexhaustible supply in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Where's the problem? But the workers are few. It's the church. It's the workers that are few. It's real easy to get into that mode of thinking, well, I go to church and I like to go to church because I have friends there and I have fun there and I have fellowship there and it's really nice because in case of medical emergency, I can always break the ordained minister glass and an ordained minister shows up to pray for me. I love it. Now, that, that's not inaccurate, but it, it's grossly incomplete in terms of what the church is supposed to be doing according to Jesus. The church exists in large part, if not in main part, for the harvest. Because as bad as it is to be sick, the reality is that every time you get sick, it's a reminder that you're mortal. And there is a bigger need that every human being on this planet has, and that is the need of salvation and forgiveness of sins through Jesus. It's the harvest. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Who is he talking to? The 72. You 72 people who just volunteered, sign me up. I'll go. Great. Before you go, there's not enough workers. Ask the Lord to send workers into the harvest field. Now, this is very fascinating to me. Because Jesus is telling them to pray for something while he's sending them out to do what he's telling them to pray to do. And God often works this way. Let me, let me show you what I mean. Let's say my wife is having a terrible day and I pray, dear God, would you please help my wife have a better day? God would look at me and say, I will answer your prayers. And Jason, I have designated you as her husband to answer your prayer. Go cheer her up. 
Or I, I have three sons. Kathy and I have three sons. I, I, I pray, God, when they grow up, I want them to fear you, follow you, love you. I want them to be all about your kingdom. Whatever they do for a living, I don't care. As long as they're following you, I'm great with that. God, God listens. Does God listen to that prayer? I think he does. I think that prayer honors him. And it shows love. And do you know what he would say to me? That's why you're their dad. Teach them about me. Raise them to love me. Model what it means to follow me. See, we pray for things, and many times, not always, many times, God says, I have decided to answer your prayer, and I will use you to be the answer to your prayer. He sends out these 72, and as he sends them, he says, ask God to send workers while you go out to work. Do you want to see a large harvest in God's kingdom. Do you want to see people's eternal destinations changed? Pray for that. Pray like crazy about that and realize that in part, God has appointed and positioned you in your world, in your family, in your place of employment, in your circle of friends, in your community to in part be the answer to your own prayer. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out more workers into his harvest field. Let me tell you how you can pray for this very specifically for our local congregation. And in just a few weeks, we are going to formally begin searching for another pastor at Hope. We're going to find a man, call him to be a pastor at Hope. It's going to be someone who's going to help make our entire group system stronger pour into group leaders, make groups better, help our student groups just crush it in impacting middle school and high school children's lives. I guess they're not children. No, they're children. They're growing children. Uh, we, we want to have someone who's going to really help all of our guests who are new to God and want to get their questions answered, really help guide them through that process of starting point and first group and plug them in to engage with our church. Ask the Lord of the harvest to send a great worker here to our church to make a difference in his harvest field. But know very clearly what Jesus envisions when he looks at our community. What does Jesus say? Let's fill in this blank. Jesus said that the harvest is plentiful. Not could be, not should be, not might be, not maybe. It is. It is plentiful. This is a timely word for us as a church. Uh, And let me tell you why. Normally... May is is just a total bummer of a month around Hope because uh, from April to May, historically, we have a massive decline in attendance uh, just every year that happens. Uh, It's normally a season where we can spend our time preparing for a harvest in the fall because in May, June, July, the, the, the sun comes out, the weather gets warmer. Theoretically, those things are going to happen. People go camping, they're away on the weekend, and attendance kind of, well, great, we can use this time for, for, for forecasting, for, for planning budgets and, 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 and plans and, and groups and get ready for a harvest in the fall. Well, by God's plan and, and the, the eyes of Jesus on the harvest, actually, this month is currently on track to be our highest attended month ever for services. We have more groups than ever this summer. We have nine groups going on this summer. We have two starting points classes. We had one that got filled up, had to open a second one. Uh, It's just a season of extreme fruitfulness and harvest, an unexpected season of harvest for us at Hope. And you know who that doesn't surprise? Jesus, who said, that's what I've been saying, the harvest is plentiful. There's not a problem on the demand end. The workers are few, but the harvest is plentiful. Continues. Go, I am sending you out like lambs among wolves. Do not take a purse or bag or sandals and do not greet anyone on the road. Now that's like the worst pep talk in the history of pep talks right there, isn't it? Yeah! I mean, imagine imagine a football coach, halftime motivation speech. All right, team. Second half, we're going to go out like lambs to wolves. Yeah! You know, it's not going to happen. What's what's he saying here? Well, he's saying a couple things that are very important. First of all, It's going to cost you something. You're going to be at risk. It's not going to be safe and it's not going to be comfortable to go out and be on mission for me and to volunteer for me. He says, don't take a purse or bag or sandals. In other words, I'm going to provide for everything you need. Don't worry about that stuff. 
You focus on my kingdom. You focus on the mission I'm sending you to go out and achieve. And he says, don't greet anyone on the road. That sounds very rude to us. Uh, What he's saying is in that culture before uh, Google and Yahoo and the evening news and radio, you don't know what's going on in the world. So when you bump into a traveler, where are you from? Jericho, what's going on in Jericho? You know, two hours later, everyone's got the scoop and on you go. He says, what you're doing is way too urgent. What's going on in Jericho does not matter. You know, the latest celebrity gossip in Jerusalem does not matter compared to the work you are doing because we are talking about eternal destinations. We are talking about God impacting people's lives right now. So this is urgent work. Get on it. Prioritize it. He continues. The 72, after they've been on mission, they go out, they do everything they said. The 72 returned with joy. They returned with joy. Now, wouldn't you think, wait, they they just gave up time. That was like all their vacation time that they had banked up. They just spent it to go out and tell people, Jesus is coming, Jesus is coming, Jesus is coming. That probably cost them some stuff. And now they come back. You would think they would be tired. They would be exhausted. They would be empty. Maybe they would even be feeling a little bit used by Jesus because I just did all your dirty work. No, how do they feel? They come back filled with joy. Do you know why they came back filled with joy? Because in the same way your phone can't charge until it's been useful to you, in the same way until we pour out our lives in service to God, can we be filled up by God. And when God fills you back up, he fills you with joy. And the 72, they returned, and they were filled with joy, and they said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. They're like, this is awesome. Here's what Jesus said. He replied, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. All he's saying by this statement is this. I'm the son of God. I remember the day when Satan tried to rebel against God and God is stronger and he was thrown out of heaven. He is not a winner. He is a loser. Continues. I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. What what does that mean? It means the things that you normally should be afraid of. Like snakes, anyone afraid of snakes? Scorpions, probably not in Wisconsin too much. You have some massive phobias if you're afraid of scorpions in Wisconsin. You know, scary thing, what people think of you. Anybody afraid what people think of you? Anybody afraid of not having enough money to make ends meet? Well, things you're afraid of. He said, things that most people are afraid of, do you know what? They're not going to harm you. And let me explain why nothing's going to harm you. He continues. However, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. If someone takes your life because you follow me, they can't actually touch your real life. Your real life is hidden away with Christ Jesus in heaven. If it costs you money to serve and follow Jesus, it does not actually cost you any real money. It costs you the money that you're going to lose eventually anyway, either through life or through death. But your real treasure is secured with Jesus Christ in heaven. The time you're going to contribute and give up to be on mission for me, the time and hours you're going to volunteer, it's not really losing any time because you have all of eternity to rejoice with Jesus in heaven. Nothing can actually harm you on earth because your real life, your real identity, your real treasure, your real time is already secured through Jesus Christ. You want something to rejoice over? Don't rejoice because your ministry is going awesome. That is not what you rejoice in. Because whether your ministry is going awesome or it's going poorly, whether you see fruitfulness or you don't see fruitfulness, rejoice that you get to serve God. And that your name is written in the book of life. That's why the 72 returned with joy. Now, here's what's fascinating. A couple of weeks ago, if you're here, we saw what, made, what makes God celebrate. Okay, the thing that makes God throw a big party in heaven is when one person repents. In other words, one person says, God has grace and forgiveness for me. And they turn around, follow God become his children through everything Jesus Christ did. Makes God throw a party in heaven. Well, what fills God with joy? What makes God rejoice? We find that out next. At that time, Jesus, full of, what is he full of? Joy. 
He's full of joy now. Well, why is Jesus full of joy? Through the Holy Spirit, he said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for this was your good pleasure. Jesus is filled with joy when he sees God's children get it. When he sees God's children finally understand that the secret to being fulfilled in life is not through acquiring and hoarding and taking for myself. It is through pouring myself out out of love for God and love for my neighbor. That's the secret to being fulfilled. That is the way to find fulfillment in life. Now, to to summarize all of this, I want to go back to what Jesus said the chapter before this. He actually said it before this to lead up to all of this, but today we're going to see what he said as a preface to everything from Luke chapter 9, verse 23. It says, Then he said to them all, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily. Do you know what daily means? Every day, yeah, that's see if anyone's still awake at this point. <laughs> daily, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, he must take up his cross daily and follow me. Here's why. For whoever wants to save his life, anybody here want to save your life? You ever been to a doctor? You ever tried to lose weight? Okay, if ever, anyone, is, that's me, that's you. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will save it. What does he mean? Whoever pours out his or her life time, energy into God's kingdom will be given life that will never, ever, ever be taken away. So here's the big idea I want to plant in all of your minds today. If you want to live a life with joy, if you want to be filled with joy, fulfilled with joy, if you've ever left church or a Bible or a group and you were not filled, you felt a little flat, to live with joy, choose to lose. To live with joy, choose to lose. Whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever who loses his life for Jesus, whoever loses his time for Jesus, whoever loses his energy and passion for Jesus will save it and be filled with joy. So, to live with joy, choose to lose. Now, I want to show you a great illustration of someone from our church who is living out this principle. Let's show that video. Hi, my name is Chad and I'm your ordinary guy. Uh, I'm married to a a terrific woman and I'm blessed with four energetic kids. Life for me can get very hectic, um, but there's one part of my life that I will never give up and that is volunteering at Hope. Um, When the doors first opened at Hope, I knew there was a lot of work that had already been done, but I also knew there was a lot of work to be done in the future. And to me, to be a part of that, to be a part of something big, on such a great scale for God's kingdom, that was something I wanted to be a part of. I first started volunteering in areas where I knew God gave me talents. He gave me talents in dealing with kids. I could teach kids, I could help them connect and and show God's love to them. Recently I started volunteering on the AV team. Um, Computers and I, we don't get along, so there was a lot of hesitation. The first time I did it, very nervous, Um, finger was probably shaking a little bit. But then afterwards, I realized it wasn't so bad. Um, And then I also realized it doesn't matter if I'm in Kids Connect, it doesn't matter if I'm running the the slides. Um, What really matters is, is it gave me a lot of purpose. Um, I benefited hugely from it. I got to be a part of Hope's vision and mission of changing lives and changing eternities. If I can create an environment where Someone can come and sit down, relax, not worry about anything, and connect with God, and I get to be a part of that, that is huge, and I will never give that up. Um, God has blessed me in so many different ways out of volunteering at Hope. Um, It has become a part of who I am. Um, It has given me purpose. Uh, It helps balance my life out and help me keep focused. Those Sundays that I don't volunteer, I feel a little bit unbalanced and my weeks don't seem to go quite as well. Um, Volunteering to me is just a part of who I am and I don't think that piece of me will ever go away.
those weeks I don't volunteer, things just don't seem to go as well. That, that, that's an incredible statement that illustrates from someone's life in this church this principle of choosing to lose so that we can be filled by God, filled with joy and filled with God's purpose in our lives. And for those of you who love our church, do you know why, in large part, you love our church? It's because guys like Chad are losers. In fact, (laughs) you are surrounded by losers right now. Men and women who have consistently choose to lose their time, lose their energy, lose something of themselves in order to pour out so that God can, pill, can pour in. I, I'm serious, one of the things I love so much about this church is I've never pastored a bigger bunch of losers than this <laughs> church. I can say that with pride. Now, for those of you who aren't volunteering specifically at this church, I want to invite you to be losers with the rest of us. I want you to volunteer with us. Now, at Hope, what we do is we have an annual volunteer calendar. It runs from July 1st through June 30th the following year. The reason why we do that is because we know that your life changes from year to year. What you can do and what you have available changes from year to year. So we recruit people, like Jesus recruited volunteers, to use some of your time and energy to make a difference in his kingdom. And as the kingdom of God increases around you through your work, the kingdom of God increases inside of you. You're the one who gains as a result of serving. Now, in your program this morning, there's an insert. You can go ahead and grab that now if you haven't already. It's a volunteer form. What it simply says is, check the box of the area in which you're interested in learning more about serving in. We'll let you shadow, we'll let you learn more about it, we'll send you more information, we'll see if it's a good fit, and if you think it's a good fit, we'll plug you into volunteering in that area of ministry at Hope. Now, what I'm asking you to do with that sheet after you fill it out, if you haven't done it already, is drop it in the offering basket or drop it off at the info table on your way out. You have three weeks to get this done so we can organize all the ministry opportunities that we have this year. Now, we don't need 72 at this point because a lot of people have already re-upped their commitment who are currently volunteering at Hope. By the way, you see a lot of them around here in our yellow t-shirts. Um, I have, my next door neighbor just moved into the area and, uh, and, he, and I was talking with him last Sunday afternoon and he said, hey Jason, I was at the grocery store this morning and I saw your church there. I'm like, we're portable, but we're not that portable. We're not, we're not into pick and save yet. He's like, no, everyone with their volunteer shirts, they're all in. That is awesome. And I'm like, that is pretty awesome. We, our people are all in. We want you to jump all in with our incredible volunteers at Hope. I want to tell you about some very specific opportunities we have to serve right now. Guest services. Guest services are all the people who on a Sunday morning directly interact with all of our guests. These are people who open the door, who greet, who hand out programs, who work at our info table all the departments where people are just interacting with guests, helping guests have a great experience at Hope. Listen, we need 12 people to say, yes, I can do that. I'm a people person. I can interact with guests. I can hand out programs. Absolutely, I can do that. Because, listen, you're not just handing out programs and you're not just opening doors for people. You are showing people with your smiles and words and actions that you matter to us because you matter to God. We are so glad you decided to come here this morning. We need 12 of you in guest services. We need five people on the parking team. Now, the reason why we need five people on the parking team isn't because people don't know how to park. I'm pretty sure most of you got that figured out by the time you got your driver's license. We need people on the parking team because the sermon begins in the parking lot. When people pull onto our campus, which apparently is a middle school most days out of the week, they see that we care about what we do and we are caring about them and we're glad they're here and a smile and a simple direction goes a long way in setting the table for people to connect with God through our local church. We need five of you to volunteer, to say, I can do that, I can smile, I can get people in. Just, just think of it this way. With a simple flick of the wrist, you can direct tons of fiberglass, steel, and glass in any direction 
It's like having the force. Support services. These are, the, these are the people who make this environment possible. The chairs you're sitting in, the stage I'm standing on, the video screens you're looking at, all of the environmental factors we have. Listen, we, it takes crews of people to set this up and tear this down. We need nine of you to say, you know, I'm not the most bubbly person, but I can get her done. Listen, this is a great opportunity for you to create this space where we connect people with Jesus every single week at Hope. Production team, these are people who run lights, cameras, action, you know, making, you know, the, the music, the audio, the visual happen. If you've got some experience or background in that, we have two spots that to fill where you can plug in and you can be part of this production you see every Sunday. Kids Connect. Kids Connect, we need 12 volunteers. Now, uh, for those of you who say, but I'm not a teacher, most of these are not teaching positions. We need, listen, we need some adults who love kids who are excited about the opportunity to shape the trajectory of someone's entire life and you have to pass a criminal background check. If you can do that, listen, we want you, you don't have to teach. We've got non-teaching positions available, but you do have to love kids and you have to be so excited to show them God's love because listen, when our staff and volunteers run Kids Connect, they are not babysitting. They are creating the safest space in Waukesha County so that when a first-time guest walks in, a single parent walks in, they are worried about dropping off their kids. They see how nice and professional and clean it is and how smiling their kids are, that they can come in here and connect with God and not worry about how their kid's doing. And their kids will drag them back the next week because they just connected with God at their level and they know they have a heavenly Father who loves them. You are not babysitting kids. You're changing lives and you're changing eternities. We need 12 of you to volunteer for Kids Connect. So grab that form. Pray about it. Where can you make a difference? You say, Jason, but this isn't even my church. It will be once you start volunteering here. You don't have to belong to this church. You can just say, I just want to make a difference. I I don't even know what this church is all about yet, but I can make a difference. Listen, we want you to have that experience of pouring out your cup so that God can fill you up with joy. Jesus said, the fields are ripe for harvest. Jesus said, I am sending you out to the places where I'm about to show up. And when you volunteer, you get to interact with the people in whose hearts Jesus is about to show up. So I'm going to stand on this stage. I'm going to keep opening the Bible. I'm going to keep preaching Jesus. And Jesus shows up in our hearts when, when we do that because he promised he would as we read his word. And you get to interact with these people and say, Jesus is about to show up. You don't know it yet. But he's about to show up in your heart. So won't you partner with us? Won't you choose to lose something of your time and something of your energy? to help us continue to create a church that unchurched people love so we can keep reaching people because Jesus said the harvest is plentiful. Let me pray for you. Father in heaven, today I rejoice because our names are written in the book of heaven. I rejoice because, Jesus, you were sent from God on a rescue mission. You gave your life on the cross to forgive us. You wrote our names in the book of heaven, and you wrote them in your blood. Thank you for securing our eternal destination. I ask that all of us would learn to rejoice in that, to look forward to that, to realize that our real treasure and time and purpose and identity are already secured by you so that with whatever you've put into our hands in this world, in terms of relationships, in time, in abilities, we would just gladly pour that out like these 72. Jesus, you see such a big harvest for your church. You see such a big harvest for your kingdom. I ask that our church would be filled with men and women who choose to lose because they are thrilled at the thought of serving you and of seeing lives and eternities changed by you. Lord, continue to bless our church with workers who are all about the harvest. We ask this for your glory and we ask it for the good of our community. In the name of Jesus, our Savior, amen.